you're very welcome to episode 30 of The Fifth Court, a legal podcast presented by myself, Peter Leonard Barrister. And myself, Mark Totten Barrister and editor of Decisis.ie. Mark, good to see you as always. And last week, you will recall, we had a great discussion on Irish Gaelga and the law. Yeah. And we had the legendary Dohi McCorrig yeah. in studio. And mm. uh, how good was that? Fascinating, I thought. And I've certainly got a good bit of feedback in relation to that. I think people didn't realise that the European legislative process involved such a high level of Irish compared with the Irish legislative process. I think it had a little bit to do with Dahi himself. Listen back to that. As you said, I thought maybe it might be a bit niche. People mm. are interested in the Irish yeah, language yeah. and law, but it had a much more wider grab than yeah, that, which yeah, is great. Definitely. Well, mm. today, today we are in a very privileged position in that we, ha- our guest in studio is none other than retired Supreme Court Judge John McMenamin. That's a bit of a scoop for us, Mark, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, his career, I mean, you know, from, from the time he was newly, I think even the time he was in college, he was involved in the Flat Free Legal Advice Centre movement. Yes. He was chairman of the Bar Council, High Court judge for years, Supreme Court judge for years. Really interesting career. Well, I mean, what that man hasn't done in the mm. legal world hasn't been done. He's, he's worked at every level and yeah. I'm really looking forward to getting his insights into the legal profession and his experience as a judge for about 18 years, I think, and prior to that, a very yeah. successful barrister. But before we get to that, we're going to look at three cases that you have highlighted from the Decisis website. And the first is a, a curious case, and this is in relation to a child. And the court found that the child was not entitled to Irish citizenship, where his father had an Irish citizen husband. So the father, I think, was a UK national That's right. but was married to an Irish man. Isn't that yeah. it? Yeah, but the point here was that he wasn't married to the Irish citizen until after the child was born. And so when the child applied for oral, obviously, when the par- when the father and the, and the father's husband applied for the passport, they did it on the basis that the husband was an Irish citizen and that was refused because at the time the child was born, he did not have an Irish parent, he or she I don't, w- w- did not have an Irish parent. And that's the test. And so obviously, the, because same-sex marriage is a, a relatively new yes. development, it may be the case that they, they had a civil partnership or something like that. Mm. But, at the, but certainly for, for, the, for the purposes of Irish law, you had to have an Irish parent at the time of birth. That so was, it didn't matter. The fact that they were a same-sex couple had nothing to do with anything. I mean, no, if, if no, the man no. had been married to an, an Irish woman who was an Irish citizen after the child was born, exactly. that wouldn't have made any yeah, difference either. Yeah. So, so yeah, no, no, good good decision so there. I, from and and the, it, the, the, the court even said it is not without some reluctance that the court concludes. Yes, the, Mr. Know, Justice the, the, Murray was the main mover right, in this. Yes, and he, exactly. and he expressed reluctance, didn't he? Yes, exactly. Yes, OK. Well, let, let's move on now to, I suppose, a commercial matter. And this is the classic Isaac Wonder order. Yeah. And you might explain that for some of our listeners who mightn't be familiar with what that is. And this is the case of Deco Bake Limited, and it's a decision of Mr. Justice Cregan. And in this case, we had directors who weren't really happy with the way things were going. Yeah. A liquidator had been appointed by the local authority, yeah. and they just wouldn't leave the liquidator alone. Yeah, so the, when <clears throat> so as you said, an Isaac Wonder order is the name that we give in Ireland to an order restricting effectively the right of access to the, to the courts. So you have a constitutional right of access to the courts. Anybody can appear to represent themselves, um, although the company has to be represented by solicitors. But if somebody abuses the court process in any way, it is open to the court to give an Isaac Wonder order, which generally speaking restricts the, the you from bringing a case against that particular defendant. But you're not, it's not an entire restriction. You can apply to the court to bring further proceedings and the court needs to be satisfied that they're valid. It's In the UK, they have a much wider restriction called a civil proceedings order for vexation lit- vexatious litigants. But in this particular case, there had been many, many years during which the court found that these directors had acted in a vexatious manner And I'll just read out very briefly what Mr. Justice Cregan said in relation to one of the directors. He has no compunction about making utterly unfounded allegations of fraud, theft and corruption against the litigator, liquidator, sorry, employees of Dublin City Council and the legal representatives of those bodies without any regard to the effect it might have have on them. His allegations are not only scandalous, but completely unacceptable. So, I mean, I suppose the point is everybody has the right of access to the court. Yeah. But if you're abusing that right and you're going in all the exactly. time complaining about yeah. stuff over and over again, yeah. the court yeah. says, no, enough, yeah. stop. And, that, yeah. and that's essentially yeah. what happened in this case. OK, let's move on. And this is to a criminal matter and a very, very distressing matter, Mark. Um, this is the case. Uh, this case was a murder conviction. 
uh, where the individual in question was uh, found guilty of murdering his infant son. Yeah. I mean, this is this is horrific stuff. But he put in appeal to uh, put in an appeal to the court of appeal, and one of the grounds that was advanced was that the court, the trial judge who had heard the original case, had admitted a pathology report, but the pathologist had not been available for cross examination. Yeah. yeah. So there was a suggestion that there was an unfairness there. Exactly. So obviously, in in any homicide case where it's possible, the 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 remaining are examined by a pathologist and that pathologist normally gives evidence in court. The court in this case drew a distinction between evidence of fact and effectively opinion evidence. So what happened was that the report was written by the original pathologist, which also drew certain conclusions as to the cause of death. Once the pathologist was no longer available, another pathologist was put forward and what they did was they excised the conclusions that the original pathologist had made and just put in his evidence of fact, the factual evidence that arose from, say, the post-mortem findings. And then the opinion evidence, the inferences to be drawn from those facts, that evidence was given by another pathologist. Okay. And so that was considered to be acceptable. And that individual obviously could be cross-examined exactly. on, and why was, they, yeah, exactly. and why they yeah. formed the opinion yeah. on the basis of the factual evidence exactly. that had been yes. established by yeah. his or her predecessor. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Mm. So that's the, an inherent fairness in that, uh, exactly. I, w- I would yeah. have thought. And again, a very distressing sure. backstory. Yeah. Thank you for that, Mark. And we're back very shortly with retired Supreme Court Justice John McMenamin. Silence in the Fifth Court. So we're delighted to be joined in the studio today by John McMenamin, former member of the Supreme Court. John McMenamin was called to the bar originally in 1975. He became senior counsel in 1991. He was chair of the Bar Council from 1997 to 99, was appointed to the High Court in 2004, and then sat on the Supreme Court for 10 years from 2012 to 2022. So, John, thank you very much for joining us. It's uh, it's good to be calling you John again, having addressed you as judge for several years. It's good to be talking to you. In a, as a human being rather than a judge. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I think you were involved in FLAC quite early on, weren't you? Uh, the, the Free Legal Advice Centres. They were founded in 69. Was that slightly before your time or were you involved in the early uh, the foundation of it? I came in slightly after that time, in the mid-1970s. It was founded by four people, Dennis McCullough, s- right. s- senior counsel, Vivian Lavin, who yeah. was, it went on to being a high court judge, unfortunately died afterwards, David Byrne, who went on to be Attorney General mm. and Commissioner, yeah. uh, EU Commissioner, and Ian Candy. Looking back, Flack actually deserves a history of its own because it has done a, a, an awful lot of interesting things. It's made a real contribution in identifying the need for equal access to justice, uh, to lo- looking at the issues of eliminating social exclusion, providing legal advice to people who needed it, and showing unmet legal need. And I was recruited to Black by my friend Kevin Feeney, who went on to being a High Court judge and is sadly no longer with us. When I went into college, it was a time... You, you were in UCD, is that I was right? in UCD, and yeah. contemporary uh, of Adrian Hardiman and Frank yeah, Clark Adrian, and, and the other people you've just yeah, mentioned. Yeah, Adrian and Frank were a year ahead of me. We were the first generation to go to Belfield, and I still remember being there, uh, walking along the... Uh, the, the avenue going into Belfield, looking at all the building going on, the administration block being built. I still remember the sound of the crane every morning as you were going into lectures. It, had you any time in Oxford Terrace at all or were you, were you in, Bel- for, in Belfield the whole way through? No, for law, we used to try and get on a bus or get a lift into Oxford Terrace for law lectures, but that right. was later on. I did art subjects first and I did history and I was very, very privileged to do history in UCD. There was a a wonderful history department when I was there. And I learned an awful lot from people like Ronan Fanning or James. Uh, Owen Dudley Edwards? Uh, no, well? Robin Dudley Edwards, Sorry, his Robin. father. Mm. James McGuire, Mary Daly, Margaret McCartan, Michael Laffin. They were all pe- wonderful history teachers. And they taught us, I was in a class with John Finley, mm. senior counsel, Kevin Cross, high court judge, and other people who went on to other great things in history uh, and broadcasting and teaching. And we were taught about loyalty to facts, find out the facts, analyse the facts, rigour. And then after that, looking at the facts and seeking to interpret them, but never, ever ignoring the facts. And Mm. I think that was kind of a good training, which played on when I went. That informed your legal practice. Yeah. And then I, I studied law and we had great lecturers in UCD, like Jim Brady, like Rory O'Hanlon, 
who mm. was a great constitutional lawyer, and then Charles Lysett in King's Inns and James O'Reilly. So we had a great all-round education. And so when you were studying history, did you were you tempted at all to go down the academic historian route or were you more tempted to, by the, the, the legal? Yes, I was. Part? I loved history. I still mm. love history. I haven't been able to kick the habit. And even now in retirement, I'm still pursuing historical interests. And uh, Are you writing a book? That's putting it too high, but certainly doing research. And I had a, a really interesting session in the British Library last week. I was over doing something else and I spent two or three days looking at letters from and to William Gladstone about Irish Home Rule. And it was absolutely fascinating looking at stuff which was actually written by Gladstone sure. and letters that were written to him and looking at the bits where he'd actually put little notes on the side because yeah. there were points of interest to him. John, I'm going to come in here. Peter Leonard, and mm. uh, we are delighted to have you in studio. And I love hearing about kind of the academic route or where you went after school into UCD. And in a previous show, we interviewed your colleague, former Chief Justice Frank Clark, and he talked about how you were almost like a tag team at various different stages. Your careers have sort of overlapped and have sort of developed at the same stage. You were both yeah. called to the High Court on the same day, I think, and the Supreme Court on the same day. Yeah. But can we go back to UCD in the in the late 1960s or early 1970s? So you went in to study history. So when did law drop? When did law become maybe your chosen route? Did you go in day one to say, well, I'm going to do history and then I'm going to specialise in law when I come out with my degree? Or did it happen in the course of your time in UCD? No, it happened in the course of my time in UCD. I have to admit, when I went in, I kind of drifted into history a little bit. And then I found out I loved history. And that is because of the people who are teaching us history, really. It's extraordinary the extent to which having great teachers influences you. And people talk about reading history in posh English universities. We prefer in Ireland to say we did history. And that's what we did. We did history because yes. we were we were immersed in it and we were privileged because in, in my class, we were able to actually look at original documentation from the 17th century, original documentation from the 19th century. I remember looking at some material afterwards, which we looked at from the 20, er, from 1916, a business record. And it was from Reed's the Cutlers in okay. Parliament Street, who were the oldest business in Dublin. And the week after Easter, you could see just a statement from one of the employees of Reeds saying the rebels have the city ruined. OK, and, mm. and, and I, I can see your love of original sources, which is fundamental to the study of history. But a history, history student in the late 1960s, 1970, what about kind of radical Europe, student radicalism, you know, Ho Chi Quinn, all that sort of stuff. Were you involved in any of that, John? Did you get caught up in that sort of stuff? I was a little bit after that time. Yeah, the gentle revolution happened in the late 1960s. My generation came in in 1970. And it's a very disturbing thing thinking this is all part of history because... Um, it doesn't seem that long ago. I, it, it doesn't seem that long ago. But the influence of the gentle revolution was still very prevalent in UCD. And people don't understand now the extent to which Irish society was extraordinarily conservative, hierarchical, denominational all the things that people sometimes describe, but I don't think it's easy to explain to people how really very conservative Irish society was in the 1950s and 1960s. And occasionally now we get snapshots of dread, dreadful tragedies, which give an illustration to people of how society really worked. And people sometimes question themselves and say, could that have been our parents or our grandparents? Yes. Well, it was. Yes, um, it was. Absolutely. So in any case, the study of history at that time in the history department at UCD was wonderful because we were treated almost as equals. And it wasn't exactly a safe space. Your feelings didn't come into it very much. People were asking you hard questions like, what's your evidence for that? And if you didn't have the evidence, you were a gunner. But what about the stuff like, for example, obviously the conflict in the North was starting at that stage. Yeah. Civil rights had moved into, you know, violence on the streets, etc. Yeah. And revisionism was taking hold maybe in Irish universities in terms of history. Did that, did that feature at all in your studies? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I've never been entirely happy about the concept of revisionism because history is always revisionism. One generation is always revising the view of the earlier generations. But all the fundamental issues which were thrown up by the Troubles in Northern Ireland became absolutely to the forefront. The question of identity, the question of violence, the question of whether violence could ever achieve its ends. All of those things, they weren't just history. They were actually politics. They were before our eyes. And 
were they part of the history that we were studying? Absolutely. And they were part of the stuff that we were talking about in debating about in college and in other universities. I suppose we, we talk about history for the rest of the programme, but I, we, we would like to bring you round eventually to, to the issues you're really here to talk about. But I suppose, could we just briefly, you were a barrister from 75 to 2004 for nearly 30 years and you were chair of the Bar Council. You must have seen quite a lot of changes in legal practice over that time. Is it possible to sort of identify any themes to how things moved from how things were when you started as a barrister to the time you went onto the bench? I don't like talking about the past, to be sure. honest. Yeah. I, I'm more mm. interested in looking at the future sure. than the past. Mm. You end up being regarded as an interesting antique to be looked at and viewed. I don't think uh, any of us would accuse you of that. <laughs> whereas, in fact, <laughs> you'd much rather, mm. I'd much rather look at the future. And I haven't really quite got used to the idea of being one of those people that I used to look at on the bus with a certain amount of sadness and say, oh, look at that person with grey hair. And now I realise I am that person with grey hair and people are nice to you. Going back to the bar, we've moved in the time that I have been a, a barrister and a judge from the Victorian era, actually, to the digital era, to a time where now looking at the future, Mark, mm. uh, we're now looking at the extent to which artificial intelligence may have a role to play in court proceedings or in the law generally. So you're moving basically, for, you've, you've seen the era of typewriters to word processors to online research yeah. and uh, papers being delivered electronically to a time when there might even be a, a machine preparing your pleadings. And as we were discussing with Richard Humphreys in a recent podcast, even preparing court judgments potentially. Are, are parts of court judgments. Yeah. Certainly I, I've been present at discussions when people have posed the question, which is better or which is worse? A very long delay in bringing, in bringing about judgments or some process where people are able to input simple ideas or simple facts into, yeah. into a computer and get an output. I have reservations about it, I must say. Yes. I myself think that judging is a human art, ultimately and at the end of the day. Mm. I know one of the things that exercises you is access to justice. Mm. And I think one of the big fights in that Flack was involved in in the 70s was the right to legal aid in family law cases and in other criminal cases. Where do you think we are now in terms of access to justice? What are your main concerns in Ireland in that regard? I think we have to be careful about the phrase access to justice, first of all. It, it can be used, it can be seen very broadly. Yeah. So really what we're talking about is access to justice within the limits of the law. I think there's a lot that has been done. I think there's a great deal more that has, has to be done still. I was doing some research recently and looking at the history of FLAC. And if you look at what happened, the slow progress in bringing about any kind of real change, it's food for thought. FLAC was set up in the late 60s. The Pringle Report, which was the first meaningful move by government, was in 1977. There was a legal aid scheme set up in 1980. It was inadequately resourced. It's always it's so frequently about resourcing. Mm. Time moved on. It was only in 1995 that there was a statutory legal aid scheme set up by legislation. And even at that stage, it was inadequately resourced. When I actually talk to the solicitors and barristers who've been involved in the scheme, especially the solicitors seeking to administer the scheme, I'm lost in admiration for the work that they did in the most difficult circumstances. Terrific people. But in the last two years or three years when I was a judge, Frank Clark, then Chief Justice, we went back to an issue which we had visited maybe 45 years before because Frank was involved in a case called Healy versus Jenahu, which had come from the Flax Centre in Ballyfermot where I had been doing some work. And Frank was the junior counsel and Eric Stewart was and Roy O'Hanlon were the two seniors. And that had done a, quite a bit to bring about a right to criminal legal aid. Yeah. But civil legal aid was much more difficult. There was the Airy case in 1980 that Mary Robinson took. But to try and bring about a real comprehensive civil legal aid scheme has been a real struggle to deal with issues like, which really matter to people, like social welfare, like housing, like labour law difficulties. And, and uh, I think I mean, people who, for example, are having their houses repossessed. Yeah, housing. Mm. Absolutely. So when Chief Justice Clark set up a committee, a working group to deal with the problems still, which still subsisted in relation in relation to legal aid. We formed a committee, we got people together, we had a conference, a really interesting conference. Many hundreds of people attended it, international experts, national experts. And as a result of that, a process was started 
so that under Chief Justice O'Donnell, Donald O'Donnell, who's now Chief Justice, there was a second conference this year. And what was good was there was evidence of a dialogue with government because one of the things that had happened was that the government had become persuaded of the fact of the real shortage of judges. And at the second conference, it was announced by Simon Harris that there would be a substantial increase in the number of judges. So that was progress, but it's incremental and it's not something that's done easily. You have to keep pushing and pushing. But then what was good was the government set up a committee to investigate the legal aid, operation of the legal aid scheme chaired by Frank Clark, and that's presently in operation. I was very curious by your phrase there that, you know, you're you're very interested in the notion of access to justice, but within the context of the law. So, as you say, there are difficulties about access to justice in terms of legal aid. And you've yeah. identified issues to do with housing, labour law, family law. Now, family law generally is covered under, under legal aid. But in terms of a lot of areas of civil law, you are not protected. And you as a judge will have to make decisions in relation to that. And you will see hard cases come before you. And you will see hard cases where maybe there's a sympathy within you in terms from a justice point of view, but they don't fit within the law. And you have to make a finding in relation to that that is consistent with the law as it exists. How challenging is that, John? Well, if they fit within the law, then it's not so hard. The difficulty is, as a judge, when you're dealing with people who are unrepresented, is on the one hand, you have to be fair to them to make sure they're able to present their case and get their viewpoint across. The second difficulty is one which people don't always realise, which is that because you're trying to help the personal litigant to present their case as best, best they can, Sometimes the other side can actually feel, hey, the judge is actually being too helpful to this person who's coming into court unrepresented. That's a problem. Another problem is the risk that there may be case law that's not properly cited, not fully cited. And that's another nightmare. Cases where you actually look at it afterwards and say, say to yourself, well, I know the barrister on one side presented me with those cases, but I wonder are there other cases? And then you do a little, little bit of research. We fortunately now have great legal researchers and judicial assistants. And I was very fortunate. So, so the judge, judge almost have... compensates from the fact that the person before you doesn't have the legal resources available to yeah. them in order to advance the case properly. You have to. Yes. Oh, yeah, you have to. I mean, that's what justice is about. If you don't, you're not doing justice. Can I ask you more generally in terms of your role as, as, as a High Court judge? I think Mark said you were called, to, uh, you were appointed a High Court judge in 2004. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. And then you served all the way up until your retirement last year. Did you enjoy being a judge? Yeah, it is a privilege. Every day is a privilege. Every day you go into work and you say, this is, I remember, I'll put it another way, I remember talking to a very distinguished academic. We were at a conference and she said, you realise you have the best job in the world? Mm. And I thought about it and I said, yeah, I think I do have the best job in the world. Being a judge in Ireland is, I think, one of the best jobs in the world, maybe the best. A lot of hard work, though, a lot of big judgments to write. You've written yeah. some very famous judgments. A lot of work goes into that, John, you know, so you're not, you're not afraid to put your shoulder to the wheel, I suppose. Oh, gosh, that, that's a really leading question. <laughs> uh, no, it's work. Of course it's work. It's interesting. It's satisfying. The funny thing that people don't realise is they say, oh, there's the judge. He or she goes out and sits between, say, 10 o'clock and 4 o'clock. But that's when the real work begins. That's when you start writing the first draft of the judgment. And in the high court, you can go through many drafts. In the Supreme Court, you will certainly go through a number of drafts before it's even released to your colleagues. Because what you're saying is the law and it has to be right. You have to make sure that what is being said actually and factually represents the law. Yes, hu hugely important. Can I ask you about that period, though, while you were a judge? When you joined in 2004, there was how many high court judges, I superior think, court judges at that stage? Not that many, actually. I think 10. 10? OK. Mm. And now what is there? 36, I think. High court judges, and then there's the Court of Appeal, and then yeah. there's a, a, an elongated Supreme Court as well. Yeah. So there's been a major growth in superior huge. court judges. What impact has that had? It's had a huge impact. The other thing which is not to be ignored is the composition of the judiciary, because we have 50% women now, which is a, a huge change. If I go back and think about the Law Library in the 1970s for a second, it was a very male institution. Not so now. But has there been a huge change, a huge development? Yes. The law is much more rigorously argued by barristers. And it's become internationalised. I remember somebody saying to me, why can't you write shorter judgments? Well, the law we're dealing with is, is infinitely more complex than the 1970s. It operates at many levels. 
you're not only dealing with national statute law, it starts from the beginning, common law, in other words, the law we've inherited from the British, statute law, that's the law passed by our Oireachtas, decisions of our courts. Then after that, we have to deal with the Convention on Human Rights and decisions of Strasbourg. And then overarching, everything else is European law and the judgments of the Court of Justice of the European Union. So we have a multi-level law that we have to deal with. And that's complex. Absolutely. Can I ask, you described being a judge as one of the best jobs in the world. You moved from being a high court judge to being an appeal court judge, a Supreme Court judge in 2012. Is that a very different job when you're moving from being a high court judge where you're hearing evidence, you're dealing much more with the with members of the public, I suppose, to sitting on a panel of judges and dealing with points of law? Yes, it is. It's different, but in no way less interesting, no way less fascinating. More fascinating? In many ways, yes. Because as a high court judge, quite often you're saying, right, let's hear the facts and there are the facts and you get them corralled. And then you say, there's the law. Yes, there's the law. And then you apply the law to the facts. Not always a terrifically complex process. Mm. In the Supreme Court, quite often you're dealing with much more complex issues where the law requires refinement, requires clarification, where you have to look at a a series of principles and perhaps a hierarchy of laws, perhaps authorities which aren't necessarily always consistent with each other. And all the time you're saying, well, what is the the just outcome? Being a Supreme Court judge is a tremendous collegial experience because you're not only you're not sitting by yourself, you have colleagues. And I was so lucky because the colleagues that I sat with in the Supreme Court were universally super. Couldn't have a bad word said about any of them. And we had a great time, but it's very hard work. But there is great collegiality, great warmth, great friendship. And I think back on it with great happiness. A few years ago, you very famously, you travelled to Poland. And I think you joined a demonstration campaigning for the rule of law in Poland. And obviously very unusual for a serving judge to effectively comment or stand up in relation to a political issue in another country. But I know that you are very exercised by the, should we say, the attacks on the rule of law. The power of the judiciary has been undermined in, I think, Poland, Hungary, Turkey, Israel and various other places. This is obviously something that you're, you're very concerned about. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah. If we go back a little bit. I was lucky enough to be appointed to a thing called the CCJE, which is a council set up by the Council of Europe. It's called the Consultative Council of European Judges. Mm-hmm. The CCJE is the French version. And it was set up in order to assist judiciaries in the previous Iron Curtain countries to deal with the kind of problems which arose on achieving independence from the old Soviet Union. And there were many problems because the whole culture of dealing with law in a communist country is entirely different from that in a a democracy. I was actually in Russia in 1989, a group of us were in Russia in 1989, and what was striking was the power of the public prosecutor. We were at a meeting and all the lawyers gathered around the public prosecutor because the public prosecutor could overrule what the judge said. So because the public prosecutor was effectively representing the government. So go back to the CCJE. I remember being there in 2008 or 2009, chatting to a Polish judge, and she was describing the kind of pressures they were under. And she said, let me show you my phone. And she also had her laptop there. And she showed me the kind of extraordinary abuse to which she had been subject for simply giving a judgment. Abuse from? A judgment in Poland, which had displeased one side or the other. There was no protection for her or for the judiciary. And we all said, well, it couldn't happen here. Unfortunately, it hasn't happened here. But many of the judges around Europe said, well, it couldn't happen here. But some of them from Eastern Europe were saying, well, it is happening for us. You know, it struck me that the rule of law is something that we have to be constantly vigilant about. I mean, going back to history again, John Philip Curran said the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Why Poland mattered was because as well as being national judges, we're European judges. We actually were dealing with cases where we might be extraditing people to Poland. And therefore, it wasn't simply a matter of saying this is a far off country of which we know little. It's a question of dealing with judges who are part of this system of European law, just as we are. And consequently, it mattered in a particular way. And it was a remarkable thing. There were a thousand judges in that procession. From across Europe? or From across Europe, yeah. And 50,000 people standing on the pavements applauding the fact that judges had come from all over Europe to protest about what was being done to the Polish judiciary. And so in terms of the, the wider, do you, do you think the problem's getting, getting worse? In, I mean, certainly the Israeli experience would suggest that other countries are going down a similar route. 
there's a, an institution called the Freedom House in mm. Washington, and they do an assessment about how democracy is doing. And they issue a report every year. 2023, they said that for the last 17 years, ironically, pretty much the time I've been a judge, democracy has been under pressure. The rule of law has not been in a position where it is, inverted commas, winning against totalitarianism. And that's disturbing. And what's particularly disturbing, I think, is that the threat to the rule of law is not purely external from totalitarian regimes, but from within democracies. The idea of democracies of a certain type, such as in Poland, such as in when you, Hungary. When you mention Washington there, one can only think of your, your colleagues on the Supreme Court yeah. in Washington. It's, dare I say it maybe uh, gently, I want to say, it seems a much more political organisation than, let's say, the Supreme Court in Ireland. Irish judges have always stayed away from that sort of stuff. There has been, you know, the separation of powers have always been respected. Uh, I'd imagine you're a very strong believer in that. Absolutely, yeah. It's fundamental. And interestingly, any survey, any analysis that's ever been done of our Judicial decision making in this state has never demonstrated that there was any question of political bias. Political scientists have actually gone through all the judgments and said, A was appointed in what year? Can we see any sign of political bias in the judgments? I'm pleased to say there's no evidence of it. Yes. OK. Long may it continue. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And just reflecting, John, I mean, you've, you've, you've had a most wonderful legal career. And as I said, you've been, you've been a judge for, what, 18 years and senior counsel for many years before that, and then a junior counsel practicing in all areas of law. And I love your concern for something like legal aid and, you know, doing what you can to sort of push that and develop that sort of area of law. What other areas, you know, as, as you say cheerio to the bench, Is there one area of law that you would like to sort of focus on and say, if I could actually change something, if I could ring the Minister for Justice and get a majority in the Doyle to vote something, vote through something in the Doyle, is there anything you would do to change the legal body in Ireland at the moment? It's a hard question. I'd need notice of that question. Yeah, well, that's fair enough. (laughs) (laughs) We're known to spring things on our guests. Yeah, when when you say that, it's not not any one. I could think of a hundred. Many things, of course, yeah. I think the difficulty would be selecting out any one. All right. Well, we're we're kind of getting to that stage of the evening where we're going to ask you about. We, I'm sure, Mark was in touch with you to say that we often ask our guests: Is there any book, any work of literature, any movie? We know we had a colleague of yours in the Supreme Court uh, who talked to us about Sibelius, I think, from Finland. Yeah. So that was his artistic recommendation to us. Any book or any movie that you'd like to suggest to our listeners? Now you have to hold your breath. Mm. I made a list. Great. Scullion, Thomas Tallis, Bruce Springsteen, Bach, uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. Joni Mitchell, Ella Fitzgerald, Rita Connolly, U2, Fairport Convention, Wagner to remind me of my dad, Jane Austen to remind me of my mum, Tolkien, and Fairport Convention. There was a song written by Sandy Denny. Sandy called, Denny, the famous, yeah, the great who, Sandy Denny. Great, great You're song. going back to your 60s here now, yeah. your revolutionary yeah. flowers in your hair, John. Before my time. Flowers in your hair. But think, nope. of, think of the name of the song. Who knows where the time goes? Yeah. Yes. Art, Crowded House. Jack Yates, Vermeer, Van Gogh. So, black and white movies. Audrey Hepburn, Catherine Hepburn, The Third Man, Casablanca. In terms of a legal scene, is there any kind of legal scene from a movie that you, you know, as a young fellow, was there anything that grabbed you? You know, Gregory Peck standing up in the courtroom uh, yeah. in the Deep South, anything like that that kind of got you I, excited? I, I don't think there's any, but any one of us who haven't tried to find our inner Gregory Peck. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. There, absolutely. There are some of us who've also found our, occasionally our inner Paul Newman in the verdict. Yes, sure. absolutely. So what's the future, John? I want to hear what's the future. You're, we're over in the British Library and you are doing a little bit of historical research. So what does the future hold? Well, for me, I'd say probably say, I, I do a bit of law teaching. Uh, I'd say there will be other legal activities that I'll be get involved in or be asked to get involved in and perhaps a bit of history. They're the three things. Chauffeuring a 13-year-old around uh, Dublin seems to me one of the main preoccupations. That's going to keep you so. busy anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. And we're looking forward to the book on the uh, the letters of Gladstone. Yeah, the, the book isn't quite about that. <laughs> that's just, that's if it's there is a ever there, a book. Yeah, well, right. if you okay. do produce that book, you'll have to come in and talk to us about it because we would love to, to do a kind of in-person review of whatever your research has, yeah, has well, discovered. Um, don't hold your breath. That'll, okay. be, that'll be a good few years. John, thank you very much for coming in and being a Not guest in the Fifth Court. The Fifth Court will adjourn until next week. So that's all from this edition of The Fifth Court. We hope you have enjoyed it. Did you enjoy our interview with Mr Justice John McMenamin? So interesting, yeah. Well, he's yeah. actually John McMenamin now, is exactly, he? Exactly, yeah. As he very mm-hmm. kindly allowed us to call him. Mm-hmm. No, really good. 
And yep. we're delighted he came in and mm. gave us some time here on the fifth court. That was a bit of a, as I said, a scoop bit or a coup, coup yeah. for us. Mm. Uh, it was it was, it was, was great to get. Can I say a huge thank you to our producer, Cunnell O'Moroin, for the wonderful work he did in helping us put this show together. I'd also like to say a huge thank you to Alison Beyond the Window, our sound engineer, who has done such a wonderful job in recording this show. Folks, if you want to get in touch, you know the usual ways to do it. We're open to any ideas that people have. We're always looking for ideas, Mark aren't we? Absolutely. Tap us on the shoulder as we walk along the street and uh, and let us know what you think of the show. So that's all from me, Peter Leonard. And myself, Mark Tottenham. And we'll see you soon in the fifth court. Bye.